My sermon this morning, I doubt, will be persuading many people in this auditorium because I think probably that everyone is already embracing the truth on what I'm going to speak about. I simply set out the question, when does human life begin? And I think in answering that question, as I say most of you, if not all of you, have the answer to that, and you didn't get it just from science, medical science in particular. Remember, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 says, that all scripture is given to me inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's teaching, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished in every good work. As you well know, a great host of people in this country do not believe that the unborn child is even a human. I wonder sometimes how much they really, down deep in their heart of hearts, believe that. I have gone back and have done this over the years, in fact, and with the Internet it makes it a lot easier to do, and looked at what it has to say, that is, different ones of medical authorities and others regarding the development from the time of conception to birth and even till old age and death of a human being. And there's some amazing things in there and one thing modern science has done is show a great deal that we didn't know some years ago anyway as far as some details. But I don't depend upon that to determine who is a human who's not a human or when human life begins. I've quoted to you 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17 as to the worth of the word of the living God, the creator of all life. And that's where we shall go to understand this. Although I may say that there's a great deal more now, you might realize, that is available in medical science that upholds the idea that life begins at conception when the male sperm joins with the female egg, and from that point forward, life is there. And I've been pleased to see that, but that's not the current popular position among a great many people that has been for a long time. I'm old enough to remember preaching sermons like this before the Supreme Court ever decided Roe v. Wade, now a long time ago. And I have lived to see the Supreme Court change that. But it still puts it into the hands of the states for the people to determine whether abortion, the taking of the life of an unborn human baby, is right or not right. You cannot expect people who are secularist, who are materialist, who do not follow the God of the Bible and his word or handle it correctly to conclude what should be obvious to everybody. I really do not understand how that a mother expecting a child can think, well, this is not a human baby. I was pleased to see in doing some reading over this last week or so that there was, of all people, a psychologist from Harvard who worked with and did her research in, and I don't know what all, but especially the matter of the unborn child. And she had her article was, what your baby's doing in the womb. I like that. What your baby's doing in the womb. Not a piece of protoplasm 
or something that's a part of the human mother's body. Let me say right up front that the unborn child is not a part of the mother's body, like a mole or a wart or an appendix or something like that. This is where medical science can help because they all admit that a new life begins at conception. Now, I say they all admit. They admit a different being. And I know we can get into trouble or problems with definition of terms. But that little one who is microscopic almost if not microscopic, from the time of conception, is just dependent on the mother for its growth and development, but it's a different being. And let me say this too before we start with some scriptures. I said at the beginning that from the time of conception, all that happens is that the baby grows and develops until it can live without, outside of its mother and live on its own. And yet even then, for quite some time, it's very dependent upon its mother or its parents. And it will grow gradually from infancy to being a baby to a toddler and so on. But you know, teenagers may have a hard time understanding this. They're dependent upon their parents until people reach maturity. And then, as once I said, it's all downhill from there. But then, then there's the matter of age. And it's just a change of things. Because I certainly, at my age, realize there's a big difference now, physically and mentally, from what it was when I was 40 and what it was when I was 20. But you know, I'm the same person I was when I was conceived. And through that nine months of pregnancy and when I was born and all these years, I'm still one person. Now, if you say, yeah, but you don't, you don't begin to be a person, a human baby when you're conceived, then where do you draw the line and say you begin from here? Some people would say, well, in the beginning, when Adam and Eve were created, God breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. It must be when they take their first breath. Well, I might agree with you on that if you were created like Adam. Or Eve, for that matter, where he caused a deep sleep to come upon Adam, and he took from his side a rib and made a help suitable, help meet for Adam. He made female. And I don't doubt that he breathed into her. Nostrils, a breath of life also, when he became a living soul. The word, by the way, in Hebrew, in breath of life, is plural, breath of lives. And you'll see that when the flood is brought upon the earth, that destroyed everything within, that had the breath of lives. And that covers animals and all. So it's not just talking about with the first breath, there was a soul. It's talking about biological life started. But now that's not the way that people get here today. People start when they're conceived. There's a complete difference in the fertilized egg and before when the two sperm and egg were separate from one another. Now I won't go into all that now. In fact, you could spend forever with the material that's out there of going through every bit of the development physically from the time of conception all the way to birth. And it's interesting if you'd like to look at it. But it's still just change of the same thing. It's still just growth and development. Now let me read you something. And I think probably this is one of the most often quoted scriptures on this subject. And I read from the King James Version. You may have a new King James or some other but I read from Psalm 139, Psalm 139, verses 13 through 16. 
For thou hast possessed my reins. In the King James Version, that means my, my powers, my substance, my being. Thou hast covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. Now listen to this. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret and curiously wrought in the lowest part of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, that means not complete. And in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance were fashioned, but as yet there were not all of them. How precious also are thy thoughts unto me, O God! How great is the sum of them! Notice that we read in this verse from the psalmist about how he was yet unformed, that he was made in secret. In other words, in a place that was invisible to the naked human eye. Notice that the Holy Spirit used the personal pronouns in these verses. Now that indeed means it's a person. Present before birth. Obviously, he's not talking about after birth. He's talking about a person before birth. He's talking about human life. Now, here's what we need to understand. This is the revealed mind of God, not trying to deal with it, with modern scientific terminology or what can be seen today through various advances in medicine. But he assumes a continuity of life from before the time of birth to after the time of birth. The same language and the same personal pronouns are used indiscriminately for both stages. Now, sometimes we think, well, the specific terms like are used today by trained medical people and scientists are not found here. Well, of course not. If you'd gone back to the year 1200, 1300, you wouldn't have found them either. Because they developed as man developed and through his research learn things, men begin to classify things, give proper terms. That's happened in every area of science. But you have a good description here of a number of things. My substance was not hid from thee. In other words, you could see it. But I like the idea of when it was made in secret and curiously, which in the days of King James Version means amazing to me, Curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. And then the next one, verse 16. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being imperfect or unperfect. It's obvious that the unborn child is not ready to live outside the womb. God in his infinite wisdom put together the whole conception, maturation, and birth process. But I like the one that says, and in thy book all my members were written. Now one of the things that's come out in recent years when it comes to the matter of genetics and DNA, deoxyribose, or nucleic acid, is that now they know it's just a language. And the color of your hair, the color of your eyes, everything about you physically is written in that genetic language. And what could he mean here except in thy book all my members were written? Even people are using that kind of terminology to refer to the DNA. 
And one of the greatest fields of medicine right now is in the area of genetic involvement in DNA as to what can be done with cancer and all sorts of things. You know, that couldn't have been done not that many years ago. They had no way of knowing it. Which in continuation were fashioned when as yet there was none of them. There's another important point about this because it's obvious there's life there. But when you're reading in the book of Hebrews, you find a very interesting point. And that is that God is the Father of spirits. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse number 9. Question. James in James chapter 2 says, the body apart from the spirit is dead. That's the best definition of physical death you're going to get. The body apart from the spirit is dead. But God's the father of the spirits. And I've already affirmed that human life begins at conception. So when do you think God put that spirit into that person? Because it had to be a person. A human person has a spirit. And if it's not conception, where does he put it? After a week? After six weeks? After three months? At birth? He does it at conception. I won't go into this because I don't know that it can be absolutely proved, but it is absolutely observed in microscopic examination of the very split second that the egg fertilizes or is fertilized by the sperm. Now this is so fast that's hard to measurable, but with microscope it does. And this is amazing to me, and I think I know what it is from the scriptures. As soon as the conception takes place, there's a flash of light. And that can be noticed and has been recorded. Now, they may say it's some chemical process that happens right at the moment because there, is, there are chemical processes. In other words, when that sperm unites to that egg, it shuts down any possibility of any other. And that within itself is amazing that just that can happen. But a flash of light. I know at conception God puts the spirit that is your spirit in this body. And I know from scripture that when that spirit leaves this body, this body's dead. But the spirit itself does not cease to be a center of your very person, independent of all other persons, for God is the father of your spirits. In Jeremiah 1, verses 4 through 5, Then the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Before, now keep in mind what we read from Psalm 139, 13 through 16. Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. And I ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. Now look at that. Before I formed thee, before your body was formed, I knew you. Why? How is that possible? Because God formed the Spirit. I've often said this, and it ought to make people think very seriously about what they're doing. God is so worked out, for lack of a better way to put it, a partnership with man. that when you engage a man and a woman in the procreative process, you bring into existence a spirit, a person. Not that you created it, but that process, God put that spirit at conception in that baby, and so it shall ever live as a center of its own personality just like we do, and it will be in heaven or hell when time is no more. 
Look at what a responsibility has been placed upon man by God when he said, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Every time the procreative act is engaged in and a conception takes place, God puts the spirit in that baby. And it will always exist as a person. That ought to really cause a lot of folks to think about their children. No wonder the Bible has a lot to say about rearing children and the nurture and admonition of the Lord and all that's involved in being parents when it comes to rearing children. But from Jeremiah 1, 4 through 5, it's clear that God tells Jeremiah that he was set apart to do what God called him to do before he was born. Now, that doesn't indicate that there was personhood present from conception forward and before Jeremiah's birth, what words would have to be used to do it? So, this verse indicates that God considered Jeremiah a person that he was known before he was formed. And thus, when you go through the scriptures and look at all of this, and this won't deviate on any passage bearing on these things, there's continuity between a child that is conceived and a child that is born. And every child, every child has that gradual development. Every child has this before birth. So the issue is this. Was that past personal or was it impersonal with personhood beginning only at birth? If you believe the Bible would be the infallible, the inerrant, the all-sufficient, and final revelation of God to man, it's obvious it begins at conception. There's no other place you can put it. I want you to consider this, Luke 1, coming to the New Testament, Luke chapter 1, verses 39 through 44. This ties in with what we've already said. It's not independent of it. None of these are. So the scriptures reveal that there is personhood before birth. The personal nature of the references in the Bible shows how God views the unborn child. Now, keep in mind, I want to view the unborn child like God does. He created it. I don't want to view it by how some people do. We don't even believe in God or don't believe in the Bible. Another text then is this one, Luke 1, 39 through 44. And Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. And whence is this to me, that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For, lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. The babe leaped in my womb for joy. That's John the baptizer, unborn. The cousin of Jesus according to the flesh. Now we read in this passage of a meeting between Mary the mother of Jesus and Elizabeth. That's obvious. And here Elizabeth describes the life in her womb as the babe. Now, what's interesting is you go back to the Greek language and the word is brephos. What's interesting about brephos is that it doesn't just translate meaning an unborn infant or babe, but it's used of born children also. That is, life existed before birth in the womb, human life, and exists the same after the baby's born. 
And notice the babe leaped in the womb, and she ascribes it for joy. Now, one of the interesting things, and I found it so, and I was just reading it last night. I read it earlier this week, but went back over it last night. This woman from uh, Harvard who's done this study has some wonderful things to say in her observations. Some of you may have read some of this type of thing, maybe not just this one, about what is your baby doing in the womb? And it begins to talk about, and we've known this for a long time, you can read to your baby, you can play music, and it hears all those things. But especially the last month of what you can do and what the baby will do and how it will react and all of those particular things. I won't try to go into all of them right now, but it's rather, rather amazing. Now, it's not amazing to me or to you if you follow God's word, the creator, and put it all together. Now, I don't know how mother can go through all of this and say, well, I don't have a human life to me until it's born. Well, that shows you how that you can just completely go against your natural powers. But what it does is go into some very specifics regarding what they've learned just from scientific observation about babies before they're born. And, and it just thrills me. I, can, I have a hard time discussing it and reading it without bringing a tear to my eye. Uh, it's been that way with me all my life. Every time I would watch anything where a baby is born to see, to see a child, it's just marvelous. And to use words of the King James Version, and that my soul, soul knoweth right well. It's just beautiful that God has ordained such a thing. And then to have these horrible creatures trying to go around and say, abortion on demand that you can just engage in casual sex or recreational sex, to use terminology used over at the University of Texas in giving pamphlets out to incoming freshmen as to what to do about things when they're engaged in recreational sex and all that kind of mess. To realize then that people just simply want to do things the way they want to do it. And when God talks about people or women not even have a, natural inclinations of a mother they go against nature they go against the natural laws that make them what they are they fight against it because they have a will they can do that and so many other things like it let me read you something else Exodus 21 back to the Old Testament under the law of Moses if men strive Verse 22, verse 22, Exodus 21, 22 through 24. If men strive and hurt a woman with a child so that her fruit depart from her and yet no mischief follow, he shall be surely punished according to the woman's husband will lay upon him, that is, a fine of some sort, and he shall pay as the judges determine. Now watch the next part. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. Now the harm that is being talked about here is not talking about harm done to the pregnant mother. It's talking about harm done to the unborn child. So in the first circumstance, if she's hurt and two men are fighting and whatever happens, they, she gets in the way or whatever, if she's hurt but no harm comes to the child, the premature child is born but lives. Thus, there's this fine that's levied against him. But notice what happens if the child's born prematurely and harm that follows is the death of the child. Immediately, he says, life for life. That child's been killed. Well, you can't murder or kill that which is not alive. You can't do it. And even back under the law of Moses with things not as clear as they are in the New Testament, they were certainly clear enough for them to know that the unborn child is a child, a human child, and is alive in the womb. 
A fellow by the name of John Frame in the book Medical Ethics says, and I'm quoting, there is nothing in Scripture that even remotely suggests that the unborn child is anything less than a human person from the moment of conception. And that means fertilization, conception at fertilization. So where are we? Well, a purely scientific examination of human development from the moment of fertilization until birth provides no experimental method that can gauge humanness. So you can't do it solely and only by science. All you have is described, or when it is described by science, are stages of maturation. They have been described, and you see those changes. And anybody that wants to look at any prenatal chart, you can see those changes. And they've assigned certain names according to modern science and the development of the child to that. But it's still a child from conception. Chemical processes and changes in size and shape, that's all been analyzed and will be analyzed again. Electrical activity has been monitored. But in saying that, even with this vast amount of knowledge, if you just look at scientists who don't claim any belief in God and they rest strictly upon their science, there's no consensus among scientists as to where along this marvelous chain of events an embryo, zygote, fetus, baby, depending on who you ask, becomes a human. And if it does not become a human at fertilization, at conception. You're in a sad situation to try to prove what it does. Because nothing, as I said a while ago, changes from the standpoint of personhood. It just changes in development until birth, and then babies or infants, babies, children, little children, big children, right on up, then it goes the other direction. And here's what we'll deal with later on, Lord willing. When you get down on my end and some of your ends of the spectrum of human life, is it any wonder then that euthanasia begins to be talked about? Because they have a hard time telling you when human life ends and when you're not a viable human being. You would expect that when you think of it because they don't even know when human life begins. But we who are enlightened by the word of God, who have all things given to us that helps us form the proper view from the very creator himself, we know. That's the reason Christianity changed the whole world, especially the Western world, over 2,000 years. If you go back to the first century and for several centuries before that, families had complete power. I have a letter that has come down to us. Should have brought it, but it didn't. Where a husband is writing home to his wife and tells what to do if she delivers the baby before he comes back. Said, if it's a little boy, then here's what you do with it. A little girl, go ahead and expose it on the mountain. We don't need a little girl, in other words. You say, how could people do that? How can people do what they do today? Because we're all the same people. We can die, deny the obvious. We can deny the facts. Because we don't want them to be that way. We want something else. And our wills are very strong. And you can read Romans 1 and people not desiring to retain God in their knowledge and God giving them up to do all those things. Well, that's the way we are. You see, we determine the direction we're going. And if I want to deny the unborn baby to be a human person, I can do that. Well, we'll reap the consequences of that stuff. Science has, however, revealed the intricate developmental continuum from fertilization through maturation to the birth of the child. And that stands in complete harmony with the revelation of God. It is no theory. Each stage flows seamlessly into the next with a myriad of detailed embryological changes followed by organ growth and finely tuned development 
that somebody says is choreographed with precision. And the more we learn about the process, the more amazingly complex we find things to be. So what are we going to say? We're going to say that life begins at fertilization <clears throat> and it just develops right on until we die, whenever that is. And the spirit or the body apart from the spirit is dead. So we need to go and let the Bible determine what's what as to when one is a person and who put the spirit, the human spirit in that person and when and take our stand there. Brethren, we're not striving to mix politics in the way some people think with religion, <clears throat> but I want to remind you something. Colossians chapter 3 and verse number 17, whatsoever ye do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. We must have biblical authority behind every belief, now watch it, and every action. We happen to be in a country that allows us freedoms guaranteed to us by the Constitution. We have rights. And we're Christians, in the way the Bible defines and uses that term, living this country with these rights. We have on top of that the great obligation placed upon on us by our God and our Lord and Savior Christ to speak the truth and to speak the truth in love. And part of that truth is when a person becomes a human person and to oppose those who would declare that an unborn baby is not a human person. Have you ever noticed in passing that if you're raising purebred cattle, nobody argues over when that calf became a calf. Especially if it's registered. Or especially these racehorses that get so many hundreds of thousands of dollars to get a colt from this, somebody that's run all the races. They don't ever wonder, well, I wonder if this is a horse that this mare is going to bear. Will it only be a horse after it's born? Is the chicken that hatches only a chicken after it hatches? And on and on you could go. They, they never questioned that. In fact, you know that in some of those areas, the things so expensive in uh, registered animals, you can get insurance on them before they're born. But when it comes to a human being, we're all, we're all mixed up. And it's for this reason. We want to gratify our lusts, and we want to do as we please. You know, that horse can't do that. That chicken can't do that. That pig can't do that. Your cat can't do that. It's going to act according to the genetic code that it's its book that God put it in. It's going to be a cat. That cat can't say, I'm going to transition into a dog. I've seen how much fun these dogs have at chasing cats. I'm just going to transition into a dog and chase some myself. You know, why do we smile at something like that? You know why? Because I think that way is stupid. And that grown people, supposedly educated, can think that way is terrible and we normally would laugh at it. But folks, these folks are running our educational systems. They're running our government. They're running everything. I'm saying to you to be faithful to God and act according to the authority of the New Testament. You've got to be a Christian and stand up and speak out against it and cast your vote the right direction. And it can't be for wholesale abortion, the murder of the unborn. You will die and go to hell if you commit that sin. And it is a sin. And if you say, well, I don't think it is a sin. What is it? 
Sin's the transgression of God's law. Can you kill an unborn person and get by with it because you just don't want it anymore? It's bothering your gay lifestyle or your high lifestyle, whatever style it is, whatever it is, it's contrary to God's will. When somebody who as a senator voted against the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act, which would limit federal funding for abortion on a government-wide basis, then you can't support a thing like that. Taxpayer funding abortion. When someone voted for the Women's Health Protection Act, a bill that would enshrine unlimited abortion until birth in federal law and policies and eliminate existing state-level protections for unborn children and their mothers, such as parental involvement measures for minors, Christians, and acting according to Colossians 3.17, can't support such people as that. If you can, you can support any murderer. Because when you take the life of that innocent baby in the womb, you have committed murder. On and on you could go with all these people who are championing these things. And that doesn't mean that everything about everybody else is exactly as the Bible teaches it ought to be. But now I mark this. I'm going to close the lesson here. When Paul was arrested in Jerusalem, Paul was not just a Jew and a faithful apostle and preacher of the gospel, but he was also in this world a Roman citizen. And thus he had rights a great many people in the Roman Empire did not have. And he's the one that wrote, by inspiration, Colossians 3.17, and he lived according to it. And when he learned he was not going to receive a fair hearing and trial from the Jews in Jerusalem, and he was even warned by his nephew that there were these people who had taken a vow they wouldn't eat a drink till they killed him, he approached the chief captain and let him know, I'm a Roman and I'm not being treated with the rights that belong to Romans. And have you ever noticed they put together, the Romans did, a small army to escort him from Jerusalem to Caesarea? Now let me ask you something. If those men had decided to attack them and take Paul, what do you think they would have done, that small army, to protect Paul? And therein is an example that's not just an historical example, but it shows you how that even under a despot-type dictatorship that was imperial Rome, a person with Roman citizenship and a Christian could use those rights to protect himself. And then when he got over to Caesarea, he's there for a couple, three years, and he appears to make his defense and preach, in so doing, preaching the gospel to Felix, Festus, and Agrippa. And so he realizes when the Jews come down from Jerusalem and make their appeal, and he's not going to get any fair trial from them, so what does he do? He has this right, as any Roman citizen did. I appeal unto Caesar. And immediately that took it completely out of the hands of anybody else. Because every Roman citizen had a right to actually come before Caesar himself and make their defense. That's what happened. And everything was set in motion. Then the whole of the Roman Empire put Paul on a boat and we see how God intervened providentially and he gets over to Rome. And all that happened because Paul used what he had as a right in a civil government to get him past a lot of things that were just wrong. Now, brethren, we today live in a country where our religion is protected by the Constitution of the United States. And even though a lot of people are acting contrary to the Constitution of the United States today, we must use these things as Christians to spread the gospel and defend the faith and expose error, regardless of the kind of error it is or what it makes people think of us when we stand for the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And if human life beginning conception, is not worth standing for, then why in the world should I want to go preach the gospel to anybody? 
Why should I want to talk about the church, this organization, work and worship, if I can't even stand up for the truth of God's word from our creator, the creator of human life, that says he's the father of spirits that live, that, that, that lives. The father of spirits. And that life begins at conception. And to murder an unborn child is to do just that, murder it. It's not removing a piece of protoplasm. It's killing an unborn baby. And listen. Those who need defending more than anybody else on this earth are those who cannot defend themselves. And by the thousands, even with the changes of the rules, they're being destroyed. But I'm not about to be quiet or to be a part of something that allows that kind of thing to happen without speaking out. And Lord willing, we'll do a lot more of it. That's just the beginning. There's so much more in the way homosexuality and all that stuff that's contrary to the will of God. So when we talk about dealing with these things, use the freedoms we've got before we don't have them anymore. To spread the gospel, to preach to the people who want to hear it and need to hear it. Maybe they don't want to hear it, they need to hear it. But then to defend the unborn who cannot defend themselves. We haven't talked much about today about becoming a Christian. We've talked about moral matters and what the Bible teaches about when a person is a person and becomes a person. And our duty as members of the church of the Lord, and we don't do it, who's going to do it really as it ought to be done in defending those who can't defend themselves. You wouldn't think anything of it. A little three-year-old was tumbling around out here and running out there and getting out of the way of a car or if a snake was after her, a dog was after her. You'd do all you could to save that child. Well, what about before it's born? From its own parents. There's where the, you know, a baby before it's born should be in the most secure environment it'll have, but it's not anymore. With a great many, it's in one of the most dangerous places it can be. We in the church to bring humankind back to where it ought to be in morality must preach these things and a whole lot more. If you're not a Christian, we urge you to become one today. And the only way you can, by believing in God, in Christ, is the Son of God. Repenting of your sins, Acts 17, 30. Confessing your faith in Christ as the Son of God, Romans 10, 10. And being buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission and forgiveness of your sins. Acts 2, 38, Romans 6, 3, and 4, Galatians 3, and verse 27. That's the only way you become a Christian. You do less than that and you won't become a Christian. He doesn't require more than that. But that he requires, obedience from the heart to that form of doctrine which was delivered to you, being then made free from sin, you became the servants of righteousness, Romans 6, 17, and 18. To obey the gospel of Christ, God's power to save, Romans 1.16, is of the utmost importance. And then rise up and take your stand to fight the good fight of faith in morals and religion. Not time to be a coward. Now's the time that try men's souls. But let us be up and feed the fire right back to them with the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Don't be afraid, but rise up and stand where David once stood before Goliath. And cry out, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? There's the attitude of the Christian. If we don't have it, we need to do some repenting ourselves. If you need to obey the gospel, now's the time to do it. If your child of God need to repent of sins, we urge you to do that and do so now while we stand and while we sing.